Williamson Farmers Co-op is proud to sponsor the Children's Barnyard. Think of us for all your supplies for the lawn, the garden, your pet supplies, equine supplies, livestock and farm supplies. We also have wildlife feed and plot, hunting supplies. Everyone is welcome at the Co-op and we do appreciate your business. We're looking today at one of the most familiar picturesque landscapes in Tennessee. Cattle grazing on the landscape, the pastures throughout the entire Williamson County and Tennessee. Cows are ruminant herbivores, which means they're plant eaters, and they have a very unique four-chambered stomach, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. Cows can utilize this land and products that we cannot use, which makes them one of our best assets. How do they do this? Well, let's take a closer look. Today we have a special guest today. This is Franklin, the Holstein steer. He's two years old and we are on loan at MTSU's beef farm today. Um, Franklin actually came, started his life in Missouri at the Purina farm and through a gracious donation MTSU now has him on their wonderful beef farm. But you'll notice today something, we got a little, something a little bit different about Franklin and the fact that Franklin has a hole right in the side of his stomach. And for all intents and purposes, we're going to call this a fistula. And a fistula is really a hole in the skin lining between the skin and the stomach. And we'll talk about the fistula in a little bit more detail here in a bit. Before we start talking about Franklin's fistula, I'd like to cover a little bit about the history of how we became using the fistula. It's kind of a funny story. In 1822, a fur trader got shot in the gut. And when they took him to the local doctor, which is an army surgeon, well, they didn't think he would survive. He'd been shot right through the gut, through the stomach, and then out. Well, for some reason, he lived. And when it began to heal, it still left that hole between his stomach and the skin lining. So you could still see right into the skin, right into the stomach. Well, he paired up with that army surgeon. And for the next 10 years, that army surgeon performed studies on the digestive system. Nobody had ever learned or had any idea how the digestive system had worked until this study. And so they paired up for 10 years where they were doing digestive studies on this gentleman. Well, after 10 years, they kind of went their separate ways. But this gentleman that got shot, this fur trader, actually lived another 60 years after getting shot. So what makes a cow a cow? Actually, it's the cow's stomachs. Many believe that a cow has four stomachs, when in all reality, they actually have one stomach that is in four parts. The reticulum, the rumen, the abomasum, and the omasum. When cows ingest feed, it comes into their mouth where they chew on it and break it down a little bit, proceeds down the esophagus into a, a large vat that we call the rumen, and then circulating through the second part of the stomach called the reticulum, then on through the third part of the stomach called the omasum, and finally into the fourth stomach, what we call the true stomach, which is the abomasum. Now this stomach is the one most similar to the humans that we have. And then it proceeds on out the small intestine and acts just like the digestive system of humans from this point on. But the rumen is the most important part of the cow's stomach and it's really what makes a cow a cow. The rumen environment is called a fermentation vat and we'll get into that in, in a little bit more detail here in a little bit. But the rumen environment is one of the most unique environments there is in nature today. The rumen is a very unique part of anatomy. The actual size of the rumen is quite amazing in itself. The size of the rumen can actually hold about 50 gallons of actual feed. Just to give you a bit of perspective on the actual size of the rumen, today I'm holding a 32 gallon size trash can. And just imagine that this is your only, you're holding only about two thirds of the amount of feed that's actually contained in the rumen. Once inside the rumen, we break down the material into three different layers. At the bottom layer, we have fluid as well as the freshest intake. The middle third is our digested, has been partially digested over the last few days. And at the top level, we have our gases, methane, carbon dioxide. Now every 45 seconds, there's a ruminal contraction that actually mixes this mixture continually. Many of you have probably heard the term chewing the cud. Well, what does chewing the cud actually mean? It means cows are ruminating. Or another name for rumination is regurgitation. Cows are regurgitating food that's in their stomach up through their esophagus back into their mouth, which they then further chew and break down and then re-swallow and it comes back down into the rumen for further breakdown. So why can cows eat grass and utilize it and humans can't? The answer lies within the stomachs of each organism. Humans have what we call simple stomachs 
that break down feed by enzymes and acids. Cows actually have a living environment inside their rumen or stomach. Inside the cow's stomach are microbes, protozoa, and fungi. And there are millions and billions of these organisms. These organisms actually attack the grasses, the cell wall of the grasses and other things, and break down these products into VFAs. These VFAs, as well as the other microbes and protozoa that are in here, are consumed by the cow, and those are how she gets her nutrients. So how do we actually get the fistula inside the cow? Well, this process is called fistulation. And this is all done under strict care from a licensed veterinarian. The first thing we do is we give nerve blocks on the skin surrounding the outside. The next thing is we cut a hole through the skin and then further we go into the rumen wall and cut another hole into the stomach. Well you ask why don't we give pain medication to the actual rumen? Well the actual rumen of cows do not feel pain. They actually only have stretch receptors that tell them they've eaten too much or they need to eat again. But there's no actual pain receptor inside the digestive system. The next thing is we take this cannula, this plastic piece right here, and we insert it into the rumen as well as the skin. Two pieces and we stitch them together. This presents further shifting between the skin and the rumen wall. And finally, we insert this rubber stopper to prevent materials from going inside of the actual rumen. Many bacteria that enter the rumen from the outside are actually killed due to the toxicity of the rumen environment. As we get ready to enter the fistula, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to remove this plug or rubber stopper. As soon as you get your first intake into it, you'll notice there's a thick layer of digesta and also a release of gases. This gas is most likely butyric acid, which is part of the breakdown of the feed. As we go in here, we'll pull out the middle third layer of digestia. As you can see, the feed is starting to be broken down by the cow. As we put it back in here, we'll start to feel around on the rumen wall and start to notice papillae, which are part of the breakdown of the feed. As I come in here, I'll notice the environment is actually very warm inside, and the further I move down, it gets a little bit warmer. The environment is actually a range between 100 and 108 degrees, and this is oftentimes based on the digestion or the material they're actually digesting. You'll be reminded that we said every 45 seconds there was a ruminal contraction moving the digesta around. And if I leave my hand in here long enough, one of these contractions will come around and actually grab my hand and seem to pull it into the cow. Now this contraction is not strong enough to yank your arm all the way in, but it is fairly strong. Okay. One of the first questions we always get asked about the fistula is, is this cruel and humane? Or does this affect the quality of cow's life in any way? And the answer is no to both. First of all, if we talked about the pain. I can be in here and all the cow really knows is that I'm in here. She does not feel pain if you remember. She actually has stretch receptors instead of pain receptors. And it does not affect the quality of life. This cow will maintain the quality of life just like any other cow and probably even better. Cows that have the rumen fistulas are actually left out for research or for just for use through their entire lives. I believe MTSU had their previous cow live to be 16 or 17 years old where she had the life of ease of just living in the pasture. One of the many questions we get asked is, well why do you actually have the fistula? What is its purpose? And there are a multitude of reasons, but for the first one is we have them for sick cattle sometimes. If a cow gets sick, she may go off feed. This may cause the bacteria, microbes, protozoa in her stomach to actually die and we have no way to get those back in her stomach and start it again. If we have a fistulated cow, we can go in here, remove some feed material that already has those quality microbes, bacteria, and protozoa. We can then have our sick cow ingest this material and then she'll have it in her stomach and be ready to go again. And another reason why we use the fistula, and one of the main reasons, is for actual research. For many of these, we like to find out as far as our feed studies and digestion studies, just like with the gentleman fur trader that got shot. We want to know how fast things are broken down and if certain feed products are broken down and can use better than others. So we may stick food feed bags or different types of hay in here and then we can instantly go in here and find out how fast the product is actually being broken down. One of the most important topics out there today 
is the release of methane gas from cattle. Well, we can use these fistulas to study the release and breakdown of methane gas. As you've probably learned, this is truly one holy cow. Through the use of this fistula, we can hopefully improve the quality of the environment, improve feed efficiency, and also reduce customer prices for beef and dairy products. And you may ask, how do you do this? Well, if we can improve the feed efficiency of each one of these animals by the feed going in, that reduces the cost for maintaining the cow or getting the product, which then will reduce the cost that you pay at your local grocer. I hope you've enjoyed learning more about digestion and the fistulation process and the importance they play today. We'd like to thank Middle Tennessee State University, University of Tennessee Extension, and the Williamson County Fair for making this possible. Williamson Farmers Co-op is proud to sponsor the Children's Barnyard. Think of us for all your supplies for the lawn, the garden, your pet supplies, equine supplies, livestock and farm supplies. We also have wildlife feed and plot, hunting supplies. Everyone is welcome at the co-op and we do appreciate your business. Here is a rare scene in Williamson County today. With only six dairies left in Williamson County and less than 400 in the entire state of Tennessee. These are dairy cattle and they give us milk, which is the key ingredient to many delicious dairy products. We are here in Nolansville, Tennessee at the Osborne Dairy, where we will be going behind the scenes and discovering just how the marvelous ingredient, milk, is made. There are six different breeds of dairy cattle. But the Jerseys, the brown ones, and the Holsteins, the black and white ones, are two of the most important breeds in the dairy industry. The Jersey is really important for the components in her milk. The Jerseys have higher fat and protein content, making their milk be useful for dairy products. The Holstein produces more pounds of milk than any other breed. A Jersey may produce 60 to 80 pounds of milk, where a Holstein may produce 80 to 100 pounds of milk per day. When looking at dairy cows, you may think that they don't get fed because you can see their hip bones poking out or because you're able to count their ribs. Well, the reason for that is because these are dairy cows and everything they eat goes to making milk. Their body only stores enough nutrients it needs and the rest goes to making milk. These cattle have access to feed and water 24-7. They are able to eat as much as they want when they want. It takes just a lot of nutrients in order to produce such a high quality product as milk. Today, 98% of all farms in the U.S. are family owned. Dairy farmers take pride in, in what they do and their animals. They check on their cattle twice a day, every day, ensuring they are healthy and comfortable. The cows are the farmer's employees, so they make sure they are happy and comfortable so they can make a living. On our farm, our cows are housed under fans and sprinklers in the summer to keep them cool. They also receive new bedding once a week. One or two times a week, the cows will receive a pedicure. This is when the cattle walk through a foot bath to help keep their foundation, their feet, healthy and strong. In order for a cow to produce milk, she must first have a baby. A cow usually has her first baby when she's around two years old. After she has her first baby, she must continue having a baby each year in order to produce milk. Cows do get some vacation time. They milk about 10 out of the 12 months. During the last two months of their pregnancy, they are put into what's called a dry period. During the dry period, the cow is not producing milk. She, everything she eats is going to the development of her baby. Once the baby is born, it stays with its mother for the first 24 to 48 hours. Then it is taken to the nursery. A baby cow is called a calf. The mother is put back into the herd to be milked with the rest of the cows and the calf is put on a calf milk formula. Dairy cows were created to produce milk and they produce more than what a baby could consume. Therefore, they have to be milked. 
thing you need to do in the milking process is to disinfect the cow's teeth. This removes any dirt or bacteria from the cow's teeth. When the cow begins, her mil begins to milk, her teat canal opens and we do not want any bacteria or dirt to enter the teat canal and cause an infection. The next step in the milking process is to dry the teat. You want to be sure to do this with a dry, clean towel. This ensures that all dirt is removed from the teat. It also dries the teat in order to prevent chapping during the milking process. Once the teat is disinfected and before you put the milker on, you want to strip each teat to check for an infection. the cow's udder, then the milk would be clumped together instead of being in a pure liquid form. If the cow did have an infection and her milk was clumpy, then the milk would be separated from the rest of the cow's herd and go into a separate bucket. Once the cow is clear of infection, you are now ready to attach the milker. The milker has four arms, one for each teeth. The milker is held on by a light suction. This does not harm the cow in any way. It gently massages her teeth to allow her to let her milk down. This is a very natural feeling and feels very similar to as if her baby was nursing her. Once the cow has been completely milked out and her, the flow of her milk has slowed down, the milker is then removed by turning off the suction and pulling the milker off. Once the milker is off, you then disinfect the teat again to ensure that no infection gets into the udder. This is the milking process done twice a day, every day, to ensure that you have a delicious and nutritious product to enjoy. All the milk from the cows on the farm is stored in a big, huge holding tank. This is called a milk tank. This is a stainless steel holding tank which is refrigerated. It stays around 36 degrees Fahrenheit to ensure the milk stays cold and fresh until the milk truck comes to pick it up. The milk truck comes to pick up the milk either every day or every other day, depending on the farm's production. The milk truck then takes it to the processing plant where it is pasteurized and packaged to be sold to you in the stores. I hope you have learned a thing or two about where your milk comes from and how the marvelous ingredient is made. I would like to thank Williamson County Fair, UT Extension, and Osborne Dairy for making this possible. Williamson Farmers Co-op is proud to sponsor the Children's Barnyard. Think of us for all your supplies for the lawn, the garden, your pet supplies, equine supplies, livestock, and farm supplies. We also have wildlife feed and plot hunting supplies, everyone is welcome at the co-op and we do appreciate your business. One of the most anticipated scenes every year at the Williamson County Fair is our sow farrowing. The sight of seeing a newborn pig is bound to put a smile on anyone's face. However, many questions arise when it comes to pigs and the farrowing or birthing process. Some little known facts about pigs. Pigs are actually very social animals as you can tell. However, the mothering nature of sows can often lead to aggression problems later on in life. Pigs were recently ranked as the second smartest animal in the animal kingdom. And one of the common misconceptions is that pigs are very dirty animals. When truth be told, they're actually very clean animals and they only roll in the mud to clean themselves and to rid themselves of skin parasites on their bodies. Pork is actually the second most consumed meat in the entire world, followed only by goat. Before we start talking about the farrowing process or birthing process, we need to talk about the gestation period or pregnancy in a sow. The gestation period is actually a fairly precise number of three months, three weeks, and three days. This precise number leads to about two and a half litters per year for each sow. Most commercial sows weigh a lot more than what people actually think. 
The average commercial sow weight is between 500 and 650 pounds. The average number of pigs per litter is 8 to 16, depending on the breed of sow. For those fairgoers lucky enough to see pigs after their first few minutes of life, they're often amazed by what they're capable of doing. When baby piglets are born, they often weigh about three pounds at first birth. And they're able to walk and start to nurse, as you're watching these pigs do, within a few minutes of being born. And by, by one week, they often establish their dominance order. When we start talking about the dominance in pigs, pigs often will select their first teat and latch onto that teat throughout the entire three weeks that they're nursing their mother. The anterior teats are often the most popular teats and then work their way back. So often our most dominant pigs will work their way to the anterior teats where the most milk is located at. A sow may have 15 or 16 teats, but they may not all be functional, which can lead to problems if she has more than 15 or 16 piglets. Within a few days of age, we'll actually pick up each pig and clip out the needle teeth that are in each animal. People may think this is inhumane, but actually the needle teeth on each animal can cause severe damage to other pigs and their other sow's udder. If we do not clip them out, the sow may become very raw on her teeth and roll over and not allow any of the pigs to nurse. They can also do damage to their pen mates as well by eating and chewing on their tail, causing infection. When you first walk into children's barnyard, you'll find the sow and her piglets in a specially designed crate. This is called a feraling crate. Immediately prior to giving birth, until about three weeks of age for the piglets, the sow and her piglets will st stay inside this crate. This crate is specially designed to allow the sow to stand up as well as lay down to nurse her pigs. There's a feed trough in the front where she can thus eat. The piglets also have a space where they can escape away from the sow. This prevents death loss by crushing. The piglets can also escape to an additional heat source which at an early age they need more heat than the sow actually needs. So we'll place heat lamps in front preventing the sow from getting additional heat on her as well. The floor is also designed with a slatted floor to allow the manure to drain away preparing a cleaner environment. When many of you first see our sow and our piglets inside our feraling crate, you may ask, what is the purpose of the feraling crate? There's actually three main reasons why we use the feraling crate. First, we can increase the number of pigs that are weaned. When a pig is first born, they're looking for two things. They're looking for milk and then they're looking for warmth. This leads to the problem of sows potentially rolling over and crushing the baby piglet as she's laying down as the, sow, the piglets are trying to get close to the milk or to the warmth. By having a feraling crate, the piglets can first escape the sow and they can find additional heat sources provided by our heat lamps. The second reason why we use the feraling crate is to reduce sow aggression. Two sows can oftentimes lead to very aggressive fighting and this can thus injure the sow, maybe reducing her mothering abilities to take care of her pigs. And our final reason, we can optimize a special nutritional diet for this specific sow. By having her kept in the feraling crate by herself, we can give, a, give her a special diet because each sow has a special needs for based on the number of piglets she has, the age of her, as well as her stage of lactation. By keeping her in this crate, we can optimize a special diet to fit the needs of her as well as her piglets. In today's pork market, we often hear the terms free range, natural, or pasture raised pork. There are many advantages to raising your pigs out on the open space. However, there are a couple limiting factors that make it difficult to execute on a larger scale. Our first limiting factor is space. As we mentioned earlier, pork is the number two consumed meat in the entire world, which means millions of pounds are being consumed. When you factor in the land requirements, as well as the reduced number of pigs that are being weaned, it becomes almost impossible to produce enough pork to feed all that require. Our second limiting factor is the stigma of pigs on farms. As we increase the number of pigs that are on farms, we have to increase the number of farms that are out there. Well, just like in Williamson County, our population is expanding. As we expand our population, which means we take away more farms. Very few people today want to build their dream home right next to a pig farm. 
Pigs play a very important part of our lives and they're very intriguing animals. I hope you've enjoyed this session with us learning a little bit more about these wonderful animals. I'd like to thank the Williamson County Fair, University of Tennessee Extension, and the Osborne Farm for helping make this possible. Thank you.